So verses about regeneration includes uh, John, uh, the most famous one in John chapter 3, about how uh, Jesus tells us that uh, 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 no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And 1 Peter 1.23, for you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but of an imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And then 1 John 5.1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Regeneration is the new birth, being born of God. Titus 3.5, he saved us not by because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Again, the language of rebirth. Uh, James 1.18, he chose uh, to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Second uh, Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. So not only do you have calling and conversion and regeneration, <clears throat> there is also the act of adoption. Adoption is an act whereby he makes us members of God's family. And there are verses about adoption, John 1, uh, verses 12 and 13. Yet all who, uh, who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of human a husband's will, but born of God. And so uh, he gives us the right to become children, children of God. We are, as it were, adopted. It actually uses the language of adoption in Ephesians 1 and verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And then Galatians 4 and verse 5 uh, talks about to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. And Galatians 3.28, so in Christ you are all children of God through faith. We are adopted into God's family upon conversion. 1 John 3, 1 continues that. See the great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Uh, Romans 8, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you may live in fear again, but rather the Spirit you received uh, brought about your adoption to sonship. And uh, by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, there are certain implications to this doctrine of adoption. The doctrine of adoption implies that God is now our father and Christ is now our brother. Uh, Luke 8, 20 through 21, uh, Jesus uh, was approached by his family and someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. I put it this way because uh, they were not yet believing in him at that point. At least uh, uh, the brothers certainly were not. Uh, but my true family, Jesus says, are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And so we are adopted into Christ's family. Uh, Romans 8.29, Christ is the firstborn of many brothers, uh, or you could translate it brothers and sisters. 
uh, Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes people holy and those that are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So in Christ, we are adopted into the family of God. God is our father. Christ is our brother. Now, as God's children, God disciplines us as the Father disciplines his children. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 12 and verse 7, uh, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? A second implication of this doctrine of adoption is that all Christians are members of the same family. All believers are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Mark 10, uh, verses 29 through 30, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. In some cases, people that become Christians were repudiated, and still are. If you're a Jew or if you're a Muslim and you become a Christian, you are likely to be repudiated by your family. But uh, here Jesus promises that even if that happens, that you have the family of God, because all believers are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, a liberal uh, twist on this uh, comes from uh, uh, Harnack, who argued uh, on the basis of some of these passages that Christianity teaches the brotherhood of all mankind. Harnack, uh, who lived in the uh, 1851 to 1930, uh, in a book called What is Christianity, argued that the essence of Christianity is the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. And while there's an element of truth to this, I mean, there is a fact that all human beings are related. We all, in some sense, go back to Adam and Eve, and so we're all a part of the human family. But the Christian teaching about the fatherhood of God is that, and brotherhood of uh, man is limited really to Christian believers. So the Christian doctrine is that all Christian believers are brothers and sisters, regardless of uh, uh, language or race or nationality. Uh, believers all are part of God's family. Uh, but uh, Harnack was undoubtedly a universalist who thought that everybody would ultimately be saved and therefore uh, could extend that to the whole uh, of humanity. Uh, but that goes beyond, I think, what Scripture, uh, particularly the New Testament, teaches. So uh, the doctrine of adoption says that God is our Father, Christ is our brother, that all Christians are members of the same family, so that we're brothers, Christians are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, but then a third implication is that as children of God, we are to imitate and to please our Father. Uh, just as parents serve as an example or model for children, uh, so it is that uh, we're to follow God's example, uh, therefore, as dearly beloved children. Uh, that's a quotation from Ephesians 5 and verse 1. And we have that, that example made uh, clearer and more explicit by the incarnation, where Christ becomes man and can... Uh, serve more clearly as an example for us. Well, in talking about calling and conversion and regeneration and adoption and previous discussions about predestination and election, uh, that leads us to a question of exactly what is the logical order of salvation? And the fancy term for this is the ordo salutis. And it turns out that Calvinists and Arminians are going to differ from each other in terms of this. What uh, 
uh, key verse uh, on this is uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, which says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he, uh, he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those uh, he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. And this verse seems to suggest that there's some sort of logical relationship between foreknowing, predestining, uh, predestinating, uh, calling, justifying, glorifying. Calvinists argue that the order is as such, that first of all, God elects, and they see that as unconditional. And upon the basis of that election, God predestines. And those he so elected and predestined, he effectually calls so that they convert. And that leads to regeneration. That leads to faith. Notice that regeneration precedes faith. Uh, which uh, then demonstrates itself in repentance, at which point they are justified. And after they are justified, they are uh, made holy, they are sanctified, and ultimately they will be glorified. And so they see that as the logic of salvation and that it takes this particular sequence. Arminians, however, uh, we don't really talk much about the Ordo Salutis, but one Arminian, a fellow named Roger Olson, said that, well, if he did, he would uh, do the, uh, uh, the order somewhat differently. And so the Arminian order of salvation, or Ordo Salutis, is as follows. It begins with election and predestination based on God's foreknowledge. In other words, God foreknows that some people will respond. And on the basis of that foreknowledge, he, prede he chooses and elects those people uh, to uh, be saved, uh, even though free will was involved in it. And that the uh, second part of uh, that uh, order of salvation is Christ's atoning work. Uh, the third step in that is the provenient grace given by God to sinners uh, through the word. And so uh, as uh, the gospel goes out, well, God, through that gospel, will uh, give the ability to respond. And in doing so, he calls them, he helps convict them, uh, he illuminates them and enables them to respond to the gospel. And if they respond, then conversion will take place. Conversion being concurrent with repentance and faith, enabled by the assisting provenient grace. And at conversion, all these other things happen. Regeneration, justification, adoption, union with Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. And that will be followed by sanctification and glorification. So if you compare this order of the Calvinists and the order uh, that an Arminian might come up with, uh, you'll see that they, they think of it rather differently, uh, though many of the same steps uh, would be put in there. Uh, again, scripture, other than that one pass in, passage in Romans 8, doesn't really uh, emphasize this ordo salutis idea, but uh, uh, there is a logical order, it would seem, and it's the job of systematic theologians to try to put that together into a logical whole. But exactly how you put it together will depend on whether you start with Calvinists or whether you start with Arminian uh, theological presuppositions. And so that's our discussion on calling, conversion, regeneration, and adoption.